of the greatest articles from the New Republic over the past hundred years, and he will come and we will discuss uh, his great book, and that's on December 2nd. On December 9th, Ken Edelman is coming to talk about his new book on Reagan at Reykjavik. And finally, on December 15th, Bill of Rights Day, our constitutionally themed program culminates in an extraordinary variety of programs, including our first ever constitutional book fair with no fewer than four constitutionally themed books and an incredible variety of programs. So please join us then. Please turn off your cell phones, jot down your questions on the note cards, and let's dive into this really provocative program with two great friends of mine and of the National Constitution Center. Erwin Chemerinsky is the founding dean and distinguished professor of law and Raymond Pryke professor of First Amendment law at the University of California Irvine School of Law with a joint appointment in political science. This understates the magnitude of his achievement in starting up basically the greatest and most successful startup uh, law school in the country, uh, which he's made a first-rate place in a very few years. He often argues cases before the US Supreme Court. He is one of the country's leading commentators on legal issues in local and national media, and National Jurist Magazine has named him the most influential person in legal education in the United States, a well-deserved accolade. Uh, joining Irwin today is Nicholas Quinn Rosencrantz. He is a professor of law at Georgetown University uh, Law Center. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He is co-chair of the great new National Constitutional Center Advisory Board that will soon be creating the best interactive constitution on the web, uniting the finest liberal and conservative scholars to discuss each clause of the constitution uh, this constitution will be distributed to school kids across the country in partnership with the College Board, which has a new requirement that all people who take the SATs study the founding documents. Nick is also my great partner in, um, I think, the crown jewel of our town hall programming, which is the wonderful constitutionally themed debates that we have in partnership with Intelligence Squared. And I hope you've seen some of them if you've been here, and we've got a great one coming up in March at Columbia Law School. He is uh, a clerk, he has been a clerk for uh, Justice Kennedy. He uh, has written important law review articles, including uh, one on a topic we'll be talking about tonight. Um, he, it's called The Subject of the Constitution, the single most downloaded article about Constitution, judicial review, and federal courts in the history of SSRN. That is incredible. For con law geeks, you don't realize how impressive an achievement <laughs> it is for a scholar to have this online resource downloaded so frequently. So congratulations to Nick for that. <laughs> OK, ladies and gentlemen, we, we've got a very serious topic here tonight. And I hope it'll be lively and entertaining, too. And the, you know, we can put it in several ways, but the, the, I'm going to phrase it this way. The question is, is it all politics? Is everything the Supreme Court does all uh, <clears throat> politics? Um, and, or is there some distinction between the justices' policy preferences and their constitutional views? <coughs> And I am a moderator, and tonight, as you know, I'm completely neutral, and I have no views in this matter. I'm just here to facilitate the conversation. But I do have to confess, I think I've told some of you this before uh, uh, from this stage, that whenever I teach constitutional law, I begin on the first day of class by saying, don't assume it's all politics. You can think that you know, personally. You can conclude that after the class is over. But if you start off thinking there's no difference between law and politics, then you miss everything that's rigorous, beautiful, constraining, and ultimately inspiring about constitutional law. And you know here at the center, I'm very keen on the idea that we will discuss only constitutional issues and not political issues, and that there are good arguments on both sides. But Irwin, in his provocative, powerful, and fiery new book, takes a different view. And he states it clearly, and he argues it passionately. And he begins by saying, um, I believe the two preeminent purposes of the court are to protect the rights of minorities who can't rely on the political process and to uphold the Constitution in face of repressive political majorities. His thesis is that the court has largely failed at this task. Throughout American history, the court usually has been on the side of the powerful government and business at the expense of the individual whom the Constitution is designed to protect. The reality is overlooked because we share the perception that the court is objective. This is nonsense and always has been. The court is made up of men, and now finally women, who inevitably base their decisions on their own values 
views and prejudices. Erwin, powerful words. Tell us more about your thesis in this book and why you believe that the Supreme Court is not objective. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here as always. When you ask, is the Supreme Court just about politics, we'd have to define what we mean by the word politics. In one sense, it's not about politics at all. No one's lobbying Supreme Court justices. It's permissible to lobby legislators. There's not vote trading among Supreme Court justices, as we accept among legislators. But if we mean politics by ideology, then I believe that to a large extent, Supreme Court decisions are a product of the ideology of the justices who are there. So often, justices have to balance. The rights in the Constitution are not absolute. Even the First Amendment, despite its absolute language, is not a total prohibition of government regulation of speech. The court has to decide what interests are sufficient to outweigh speech, to make it less abstract. Does the government have a sufficient interest in prohibiting minors under 18 from access to violent video games? That's a value choice that has to be made. Even the prohibition against race discrimination is not absolute. The Supreme Court has said that the government can discriminate based on race if there's a compelling government interest. And so all nine justices on the court would agree that when it comes to affirmative action, the issue is, does the government have a compelling interest in having a diverse classroom? There's no way of answering what's a compelling interest, or what's a legitimate interest, or what's reasonable, except by reference to the values of the justices. I'm not saying that every case comes down to a value choice. There are probably some where the text of the Constitution is so clear that all the nine justices will agree. But for the vast majority of cases that come to the Supreme Court, balancing is required, and how the justices exercise their discretion is very much a product of the values, the life experiences, the ideology of the justices. Strongly put, clearly put. Nick, Irwin has just put the proposition on the table. Uh, most cases uh, implicate the justices' values, and therefore those values are central to the way they decide cases. Agree or disagree? So, uh, Jeff, you referenced our collaboration on Intelligence Squared. Maybe I'll start with just a moment on that, and then I will uh, segue back to your question. Uh, so um, we sponsor uh, policy debates in New York City called Intelligence Squared. You can attend them live in New York. You can also watch them, uh, listen to them on NPR across the country. We have a new offshoot, which is a collaboration with Jeff constitutional debates that we do here at the National Constitution Center. Perhaps you've uh, attended some. And uh, for us, it is crucial that these two projects are different. So we'll often have debates that are actually on very similar topics. For example, we'll have a debate in New York about whether you think NSA surveillance is a good thing or a bad thing. But then we'll come down here to Philadelphia and we will debate the question of whether NSA surveillance violates the Fourth Amendment. And Jeff and I come out here at the beginning of these constitutional debates and we emphasize in our introduction that this is different, that these two questions are different. Indeed, that it is absolutely coherent and reasonable for you to believe, for example, that NSA surveillance is a bad thing and yet constitutional or a good thing, and yet unconstitutional. But these are distinct, different questions. And what I want to say is they have to be distinct and different questions. If they weren't, that would knock out the rationale for judicial review. If they were the exact same question, if the justices were supposed to be doing the policy question, you would ask yourself, why should the justices' policy preference ever trump the policy preference of the legislatures, the folks that we voted for. So the political branches want some policy. Why should five unelected judges get to tell us that we cannot have it based on their policy preferences? I think we would never sign on to that. So uh, I, I think we have to imagine that they are embarked on some different project, which is figuring out whether these things are consistent with the US Constitution, quite regardless of what they may think of the policy. I think it's uh, crucial to keep these ideas separate. And I, you know, I think in Irwin's extremely provocative and well-written book, 
Sometimes these things are conflated, the policy question and the law question, and that's what I'm most nervous about. Might I respond to that? Please, but, but Erwin, you know, Nick just confessed, he and I have started up this whole debate series based on the idea that there is a distinction between law and politics, and you're just saying that we're idealistic uh, dupes. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take Nick's example of the Fourth Amendment, because that's really when we're talking about the data collection, what we're probably focusing on. The Fourth Amendment, according to the Supreme Court, and based on its text, prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. The Supreme Court has said in deciding what's reasonable, it has to balance law enforcement needs against intrusions on privacy. So in June of 2013, there was a very important Fourth Amendment case, Maryland versus King, about when the police arrest an individual for a serious crime, can they take DNA to see if it matches that from an unsolved crime in the police database? The court five to four said that it does not violate the Fourth Amendment. Justice Kennedy said, we balance the great law enforcement benefits of being able to solve unresolved crimes against the intrusion on privacy, which he saw was minimal. Justice Scalia wrote for the four dissenters and would have struck the balance differently. He would have said that the intrusion on privacy of a police DNA database is much greater, and he would have found this to violate the Fourth Amendment. But all of the nine justices believed that balancing was going on, weighing law enforcement needs against intrusion on privacy. And I think that if I were able to be part of this wonderful debate on, say, NSA surveillance, we'd ultimately be talking about how do we balance law enforcement needs against intrusion on privacy and deciding what's reasonable. I don't understand how you can decide what's reasonable and do that balancing except by making a value choice. And yes, legislators make value choices. And yes, judges make value choices. But the way they go about it is different. And my answer to Nick's question is, that we've decided as a society that we are better off having certain issues decided by an institution that's largely insulated from majoritarian politics. That doesn't mean the court gets to decide everything. There are countless questions that never come to the court, never should come to the court. But in the realm of the Constitution, we've decided we're better off having this institution that's largely insulated from majoritarian control making decisions about the rights of the So Nick, a powerful uh, response by Irwin to decide what's unreasonable inevitably requires a value choice. I want to hone in on why you think there's a difference between constitutional and policy value choices. You said you just sponsored an NSA debate at the Federalist Society Conference, which is the conservative lawyers group, and the group was evenly split between libertarians who opposed NSA surveillance and conservatives who supported it. Were they opposing it on constitutional and, or political grounds, and why do you think there's a difference between those two things? So again, that was a purely constitutional debate we just had at the Federalist Society on Saturday. This was uh, Michael Mukasey, former Attorney General of the United States, versus Nadine Strassen, former head of the ACLU. And this was extremely high-level constitutional dialogue, but you know the, the nature of constitutional dialogue is... Uh, based on uh, arguments from text, argument, like constitutional text, arguments from constitutional history, from things like the Federalist Papers, things like this, from constitutional structure, James Madison being cited on both sides for these propositions, that's quite a different conversation from the conversation you would expect to have in the halls of Congress when you were debating whether the NSA should or should not collect everybody's data or whatever. So, on, Erwin, on that point, Nick has made a strong case for legal positivism, let's call it, the idea that the methodologies of constitutional interpretation, text, history, structure, can constrain judges. In your book, though, you not only say that judges make value choices, you make a, a really strong claim. You say, my goal throughout this book is to determine whether the Supreme Court made American society better or worse, and that the overwhelming record shows that the Supreme Court has made American society worse. What, what role does that conclusion have for this idea that there's, you know, a constitution that's constraining it and it's not the job of judges just to make society better or worse? 
Madison the famous one. I don't think anyone can find the answer to James Madison, but whether taking DNA from people or whether NSA surveillance violates the Constitution. The structure of the Constitution, it doesn't provide an answer. Remember, even the Supreme Court says it's a balance. You balance the law enforcement needs against the privacy interests. You don't find an answer to that in the past of 50 years structure. The good example I've mentioned Okay, so now we're focused on the descriptive question. Has the court, in fact, decided cases according to the value judgments of the justices and made society worse off? And Nick, as you, as you know, Irwin makes quite a sweeping indictment, both of the Supreme Court in history and of the Roberts Court, and says that in area after area, from protecting minorities to enforcing the Constitution in times of war to protecting property and states' rights, even to the Warren Court, which he considers not as liberal and heroic as liberals think, the court has favored conservative value choices that have made society worse off. What is your response to that argument? Well, so uh, let, let's think about what that claim is. Made society worse off by whose lights? So uh, the criticisms in this book are largely driven by a particular set of policy preferences, which are quite liberal policy preferences, indeed, you know, quite extremely liberal. And in order to see that point, consider the Warren Court. So Chief Justice Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States for quite a while, and it's traditionally believed to be the most liberal Supreme Court in U.S. history, subject to withering criticism for reaching liberal policy results, even when those results can't quite be found in the text and history and structure of the US Constitution. That's the traditional criticism of the Warren Court. But in Irwin's book, we hear criticism of the Warren Court for not reaching sufficiently liberal results. So this is a critique of the policy results that are coming out of the Supreme Court. And it's a critique from a quite an extreme policy position. So, you know, I want to say, first of all, these, these policy views are certainly contestable and indeed are, you know, are not broadly shared across the country. But second, I'm just not sure that's the right grounds on which to critique the court. I disagree with its policy views, or at least there's not too much further you can go than to say, well, you know, fine, I agree with, you know, I share their policy views. I'm, I'm not sure, not sure quite how much further you can go than to say my, this, this case didn't, um, I, I don't agree with these results. So please, 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 please do. I just wanted to note that you acknowledge this criticism, Erwin. At the end of your book, you say, I've been concerned that the book would be criticized as a liberal's whining that the court's decision have not been liberal enough, but my goal was not to write the liberal case against the Supreme Court. It was to make a case against the Supreme Court that those all across the political spectrum can accept. To flesh that out, and maybe can you give us some examples of cases where your policy views and what you think the Constitution requires diverge? 
Matsu versus United States from 1944, where the Supreme Court upheld the evacuation and internment of 110,000 Japanese Americans, aliens and citizens, and 70,000 were citizens in what Fra President Franklin Roosevelt called concentration camps. Would anyone today want to defend Korematsu? Or I begin the book with the story of Buck versus Bell, where the Supreme Court upheld the involuntary surgical sterilization of Carrie Buck. She was raped and became pregnant. And Virginia used its eugenics law and was surgically sterilized. And the Supreme Court, in an eight to one decision, just as Oliver and Holmes writing for the court, declared three generations of imbeciles is enough. 60,000 United States citizens were surgically sterilized against their will because of Buck versus Bell because of the eugenics laws. Would anyone today defend that? I can go on and use all of the rest of our time with examples that I think both liberals and conservatives would disagree with. So I don't think it's just my, from a liberal perspective, saying I disagree with the results. I think everyone in this room would disagree with those cases and so many more we could talk about. So Nick, Irwin has just given four or five examples of the most notorious cases in uh, history at the Supreme Court. He says, would anyone today mandate the cases upholding mandatory sterilization, striking down the Missouri Compromise, upholding the Japanese internment camps? There is, though, as you know, and as Irwin acknowledges in the book, a, a, a series of scholars who say, really, over time, the Supreme Court has tended to follow the preferences of the public. The Supreme Court does follow the election returns. It's reflected the constitutional understandings of a majority of the public at most times. And on the very rare occasions when it's tried to thwart those preferences, it's provoked backlashes that have harmed the causes it's trying to help. So what do you think of that claim that although today no one defends these decisions, in their time, almost all of those decisions were extremely popular, including among not only conservatives in the eugenics case, but Liberals, I heard a gasp in the front row when uh, Irwin quoted Justice Holmes on three generations of imbeciles is enough. <clears throat> but Holmes, of course, was an enthusiastic eugenicist himself, as was Teddy Roosevelt, as were the leaders of all the liberal religious denominations. So it's easy for us to say in retrospect, well, these things were obviously wrong. Nick, uh, and I'll just finish my completely non-leading question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you or don't you? Uh, agree that the Supreme Court has tended over time to reflect uh, popular sentiments uh, rather than challenging them. So uh, Irwin cited to a number of cases which are probably the most infamous cases of the Supreme Court and probably cases about which there's you know mostly broad consensus of disagreement, although not quite actually the unanimity that Irwin describes. Korematsu, would anyone defend that? Well, you know, Judge Posner, who is actually the most cited legal scholar of all time, as well as a Seventh Circuit judge, has, has quite articulately defended Korematsu. I think it's probably not defended that broadly in the, you know, faculty lounge at UC Irvine, but it is actually out in the world. It has some, there are some supporters. So I'm not sure there's quite unanimity on these points, but Erwin and I, I think, probably largely agree about many of these cases, but I think we're just we're agreeing for quite different reasons. Uh, these cases are um, the the results are bad and evil, and we feel that they are unjust, and we feel bad for the victims in these cases or the pe the people who we think should have won but lost in these cases. But that's not what makes them wrong. What makes them wrong is they're legally wrong. They are not justifiable as a matter of constitutional text and history and structure. Now, these happen to be cases in which both our kind of moral instinct and our legal instinct may pull in the same direction, but not every case is going to be like that, and there is a distinction to be drawn. Now, I'll give you just, I'll, I'll just say one thing about one of uh, Irwin's examples. So, Irwin cites Plessy v. Ferguson, which upheld. Uh, separate but equal facilities for blacks and whites. And that's, of course, an abhorrent result. Right? That is an abhorrent result, and we all despise that result. There was one dissenter in the case, and the one dissenter offers up a really articulate, beautiful statement as to the constitutional principle at stake. And Irwin quotes it favorably. And here it is, Justin Harlan, Justice Harlan concluded eloquently that, quote, 
in view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. I couldn't agree more, and that's why I think Plessy is wrong. But that's not quite why Irwin thinks it's wrong, and here's how you can tell. Three pages later, Irwin is defending affirmative action, which is flatly inconsistent with this paragraph I've just read you about a colorblind constitution. Irwin actually believes that government discrimination on the basis of race is legitimate and fine as long as the, uh, uh, depending on which races are being discriminated in favor of, which races are being discriminated against. And that's not the Justice Harlan view. Justice Harlan is giving you a view of the, of the Equal Protection Clause, what the US Constitution requires quite regardless. But for Irwin, he needs for Plessy to be, for Plessy to be wrong, but he also needs to be able to justify some liberal policy preferences like affirmative action. Justice Harlan wouldn't agree about that. Okay. It obviously right. requires a response. Nick Thank has you. just channeled Justice Thomas here and said that Justice Harlan was correct in Plessy and that means that affirmative action should be wrong today. What is the response? Well, let me start where Nick does. He says there's a difference between saying that a case is wrong as a matter of law and wrong as a matter of policy. And Jeff, you said that too. I still don't understand what that means in this context. The 14th Amendment says no state shall deny any person equal protection of the laws. There's a law that requires segregation, assuming it's truly separate but equal, violate the command for equal protection of the laws. You can't find the answer to that in the text. It just says you can't deny equal protection of the laws. It doesn't tell us whether separate but equal is unconstitutional. So Nick says, let's look to history. Well, it turns out that the same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment also voted to segregate the District of Columbia public schools. So maybe from a historical perspective, it's OK to have separate but equal. What makes separate but equal wrong? It's a policy recognition that what the 14th Amendment above all was about was saying that the white race couldn't subordinate minority races, and that segregation was based on the view of whites of superiority and a desire to subordinate. Now, Nick says that we should view the 14th Amendment equal protection as a requirement for colorblindness. I don't think anyone really believes that, and I'll give you the example as to why. Imagine that a police force wanted to infiltrate a gang that was defined by race. And that's true of most gangs in big cities today. You have African American gangs, you have Latino gangs, and often they're defined by ethnicity. You have Asian gangs defined by specific ethnicities. So, is Nick really trying to tell you that if the police department wanted to infiltrate a black gang, it had to be colorblind, it couldn't use a black officer? Of course not. That then means that if there's a sufficiently compelling interest, the government doesn't have to be colorblind. And that's what the Supreme Court's always said. If there's a sufficiently compelling interest, the government can use race as a factor in decisions. Now what we need to talk about is, is there a sufficiently compelling interest and having diversity in the classroom that would justify affirmative action. And I'm glad to engage in that debate, but colorblindness doesn't answer that question. This is powerful, and we're getting to some real the nub of the disagreement. So on the one hand, Nick, Irwin has responded to you by saying the conservatives can be hypocrites, too, that uh, there's really no evidence that the framers of the 14th Amendment intended to desegregate public schools, and yet people like Justice Scalia say that Brown is correct, that's not consistent with his originalist philosophy. So that charge that Irwin has made requires a response. And then second, Irwin says, really, when you define these principles at a sufficient level of abstraction, is there a good reason for discrimination or is surveillance unreasonable? These are policy preferences that the Constitution consigns to judges, and it'd be better to be explicit about them rather than gussing them up in all this methodology. Well, uh, on the specific point about Brown v. Board of Education, of course, Michael McConnell's written a very compelling Harvard Law Review article arguing that actually Brown is completely consistent with originalism and the 14th Amendment. That's maybe it's a topic for another day, but just to say there's 
powerful scholarship on that side of this issue. You know, just here, I don't mean to get too much into the, the weeds with our audience, but this debate we're having is important among law professors. Did the framers of the 14th Amendment intend uh, Brown? Do you find it, I find it disappointing that uh, the originalists on the court haven't really engaged that scholarship. They haven't cited it. There are counter arguments to it. You don't see the, the, the originalists on the court making a strong case that their views on affirmative action are consistent with original understanding. Well, that their views on affirmative action are consistent with? And, and on Brown and on all, these, on all these questions, they don't seem to be really uh, putting their money where their mouth is. Well, the powerful scholarship in favor of Brown is 50 years after Brown. So it's unsurprising that, uh, unsurprising the court is not citing Michael McConnell in Brown. These affirmative action cases, yeah, the Scalia and Thomas are citing originalist evidence in their affirmative action decisions, I think. I very strongly disagree with that. I think that if one wanted to be an originalist with regard to affirmative action, there's no doubt that the framers of the 14th Amendment meant to have what we call as race conscious programs. We could list dozens of programs that were adopted by Congress in the late 1860s that were race based, the Freedmen's Bureau, for example. And I find it interesting that the place where Justices Scalia and Thomas abandoned their originalism is with regard to affirmative action, which to me shows that there's a tension between their conservative ideology and their originalism. The conservative ideology trumps. That requires a response, I think. <laughs> well, maybe it's best to get the relevant text here out on the table. What we're talking about is no state shall deny any person equal protection of the laws, evidence of what Congress did circa the 1860s and 70s. is not actually great evidence of what they thought that was as a prohibition on state action. So it took this long to bring out my new edition of the NCC Pocket Constitution, <laughs> which I commend to you, and I, I want to hand them out free. It has a great new preface uh, by uh, David Rubenstein and, and yours truly, so I, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. But let's look at the text of the 14th Amendment. Um, and and there's, uh, how much of this question can it answer? So the uh, 14th Amendment, which is going to turn 150 uh, in two years, says, I should never, uh, <laughs> okay, here it is. Um, uh, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Nick, here you're the indeterminist saying that language is not clear and that Congress's uh, intent shouldn't trumpet. The fact that Congress uh, embraced affirmative action can't uh, trump the, 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 the clear implication of the text. No, 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 I'm, I'm focusing on the crystal clear language at the beginning of the clause you just read, which is no state shall, as against the federal government. There may well be a difference. So things that Congress did are not necessarily probative as to what they thought states could or could not do. This clause on its text restricts states, does not restrict Congress. So is it your position then that equal protection doesn't apply to the federal government? Because the reason I say this is, if Nick wants to say the 14th Amendment was just meant to apply to state and local governments, he's certainly correct. There is no provision in the Constitution that says that the federal government cannot deny equal protection. So I assume from what you're saying then that if the federal government discriminates on the basis of race or any other grounds, there's no basis under the Constitution for challenging that. So the court, as you know, has said that something like the Equal Protection Clause is reverse incorporated against the federal government by the Fifth Amendment. As you know, this is not very textually grounded, but it is the current doctrine in a case called Bowling v. Sharp. Whatever one may think of Bowling v. Sharp, though, it's certainly right that um, evidence of what Congress did circa 1868 or 1870 can't tell you much about what they thought states weren't allowed to do. I think this goes to where you started the discussion, Jeff. You want to say there's a difference between law and policy preferences. If we look at law just in terms of the text and the historical understanding, then there is no constraint on the federal government to non-equal protection for just the reasons you said. 
we have equal protection applied to the federal government by it being read into the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment because we perceive that as an essential policy preference. We can't imagine a Constitution that wouldn't say there are limits on the federal government denying equal protection. Now, if we're going to try to understand what Congress meant by equal protection, by what it did with passing the 14th Amendment, then I think it's quite relevant to look to the fact that the Congress of the 1860s did adopt countless programs that were race-conscious programs. But ultimately, the question is still going to be, is there a compelling government interest in having these race-conscious affirmative action programs? That's a question that's a policy choice. You'll never answer it based on the text or historical understanding. There is an intermediate position in this fascinating debate, and that is uh, that uh, the first sentence of the amendment, which says that uh, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States, and that states can't abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, Justice Harlan, who you quoted, believed that the right to be free from partial and uh, humiliating caste legislation was one of the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Mm -hmm. And both the federal government and the states were prohibited from engaging in that sort of caste legislation. I mentioned well, that because- Well, but, but not by that clause, which says no state shall. He thought that the first uh, sentence of the amendment was uh, self-enforcing and therefore that uh, uh, the, the, the federal government could not. Uh, I mean- No, no, no. I, th I, th I think that is to say, um, he believed that, that there were that these privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, which pre-existed the 14th Amendment, might have included such a protection, but not that that language does that work. But the first uh, sentence of the clause, which overturned the Dred Scott decision, reaffirmed that neither the states nor the federal government could infringe equality. What's interesting about th this debate, at least I hope to the three of us, I don't know if it's uh, <laughs> uh, too much for the rest of you, is that uh, Irwin wants to leap to a broad level of abstraction and say, really, these textual niceties and the historical details don't matter. These are essentially policy preferences, and we should acknowledge them honestly. You're uh, saying, no, we really have to define things more explicitly, look at carefully at the text and what the intent was, and that can bind justices. And as the totally neutral moderator, I'm suggesting that neither side is entirely consistent. Sometimes the conservatives ignore the text and history when it suits their policy preferences. Sometimes the liberals do the same thing. Therefore, what we need to resolve in the rest of this conversation is what should judges do? I think we've already talked about a disagreement about what the court has done over time. But accepting the fact that there have been cases where justices have been driven by ideology rather than politics, does that mean that we should just acknowledge it openly, as Irwin says, and treat the courts as political bodies? Or on the contrary, should judges strive uh, especially hard to be neutral and be principled rather than succumbing to their, uh, the temptations of politics? Irwin, let me start with you there. You have a lot of really specific uh, proposals for reining in the, the, the courts at the end of this. Even if you're right that you know, a lot of judges have been unprincipled in the past, why, sh why shouldn't they try to be more principled and restrained in the future? I think that's a loaded phrasing of the question. I'm not going to defend anyone being unprincipled. Of course we want people to be principled. I think the disagreement is, what does that mean? And I want to keep coming back to the examples, because I think it has to be concrete, not abstract. When the court has to decide, can the police take DNA from a person who's arrested to see if it matches an unsolved crime in the police database, they have to decide, is that reasonable or unreasonable? There's no way to decide that in a neutral way. I don't even know what principled means in that context. It's a value choice. Is diversity in the classroom a compelling government interest? There's no way to decide that in a way that's neutral or principled. It's a value choice. So Jeff, when you say, shouldn't we have justice aspire to be principled? Of course we should. But I don't know what that means in the context of value choices. Now I think we can all agree, if the text is clear, it should be followed. Rarely is the text clear in the cases that come before the court. I don't believe that the framers of the Constitution are controlling on us today. They were wise individuals, and we should look to them. But we're never going to know what the framers really intended about modern situations. And so often, they disagreed among themselves. So we can look to the history. Obviously, if there's a precedent on point, the court should follow it or, in a persuasive way, distinguish it or overrule it. 
And so I would say in that way, we can talk about what principle means. But ultimately, for the kind of issues that come before the court in constitutional law, it is, it always has been, and always will be value choices. Response. You know, I guess I just return to this question of what is the rationale for judicial review to begin with? If you believed that the nine folks in robes at the temple on First Street were actually doing the exact same thing that the folks are doing in the Capitol, that the folks are doing in the White House, why on earth would you allow those unelected folks in robes to trump the policy decisions of your elected officials? We Millions upon millions of us go to the polls. We elect our politicians based on what they've expressed as the, as their policy views and that we think they reflect our policy views and so we've elected these folks. And yet sometimes five unelected justices get to say, you can't have that. You cannot have that policy choice even though a majority of you think that you want it. Now, if they really are just made, doing the same sort of judgment, the same sort of balancing of policy costs and benefits, why on earth would we ever let them do that? Because Erwin, you, you address this very yeah. question, or when you, you say there are calls to eliminate judicial review in light of the thoughts that it's all politics, ranging from liberal scholars like Mark Tushnet to the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning historian J James McGregor Burns, but despite your grave questions about the performance of the courts over time, you still believe there is a role for judicial review. What is it? I think that we as a society are better off having these constitutional questions resolved by an institution that's largely insulated from majoritarian politics. Who should balance the law enforcement benefits from DNA collection against the intrusions on privacy? I think we're better off having a court that's not answerable to the political process decide that. Who ultimately should decide whether or not there's a sufficiently compelling interest in diversity in the classroom to justify affirmative action? I think we believe we as a society are better off having the courts make those choices. And so that's my answer to Nick's question. And it's also my answer to those who would eliminate judicial review. I think in the realm of the Constitution, society is better off having an unelected judiciary making these kinds of choices. I guess I'm surprised. I can't imagine why. The book is chock full of examples where you believe the court has failed us. You seem to think it's failed us in a majority of cases. Uh, you seem to think that many or most of the justices are far too conservative in their policy preferences, far too solicitous of uh, government, of corporations, of the rich and powerful. Why on earth do you want these unelected folks whom you, whom you uh, so discredit to be making these policy judgments and having them trump the judgments of our elected officials? I think Marbury versus Madison in 1803 got it right, that the Constitution is meaningful only if it's enforced, and its enforcement is best left to the unelected judiciary. Think of criminal defendants. When's the last time that a state legislature passed a law to expand the rights of criminal defendants? Thinks of prisoners. When's the last time that a state legislature passed a law to expand the rights of prisoners? I think that the provisions of the Constitution that protect criminal defendants, the Fourth, the Fifth, the Sixth Amendments, those that protect prisoners, such as the prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment, either are going to be enforced by the courts or it's as if the limits weren't in the Constitution at all. And the courts may often fail on these tasks, but for these individuals, it really is the courts or nothing. So, so Irwin is clear in his uh, response, Nick. He, if, if you believe, as he does, that the preeminent purpose of the court is to protect the rights of minorities and to uphold the Constitution in the face of political majorities, then he's saying that there's no one else to do the task. Uh, what do you think? Let's, let's talk about some of his proposals for reform, because they are interesting as well. Uh, you have a, you, although you don't want to overturn judicial review, Erwin, you, you have a bunch of great uh, suggestions, including merit selection of judges, um, clarifying <clears throat> the role of the Supreme Court and making it clear that its purpose is to protect minorities and to uphold the Constitution in the face of the desire of majorities. Uh, change in the confirmation process so that it explicitly considers ideology and the judges are asked how they would have voted on past cases. That was an interesting suggestion, not how they would vote on future ones and requiring them to go on record on that score. 
term limits of 18 years uh, for justices, uh, being more open in communication, um, and uh, cameras in a courtroom are just some of the reforms that you offer, and then finally you summarize them uh, nicely. You say that when the court refuses to take cases, it should offer reasons for denying certiorari, public proceedings should be broadcast, a parag the court should summarize its decisions, um, and it should uh, not decide everything in the last week of term, and, oh, and this is the most important uh, recommendation of the wall. There should be word limits and page limits for Supreme Court <laughs> opinions, and the decisions are just too long. Uh, a, gr a great range of rich suggestions. Nick, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you make of Irwin's suggestions for reform? Oh, well, that, that was 20 different things. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, what, maybe Irwin would like to, do you want to highlight a few of those that we should talk about? Or oh, what? How about term limits? Because what's interesting is, as I've spoken to audience about the book, I've discovered that both liberals and conservatives seem to like the idea of term limits Supreme Court justices. Indeed, Rick Perry, when he was running for president in 2012, supported the idea of 18-year non-renewable terms. Thankfully, life expectancy is a lot longer today than it was in 1787. Clarence Thomas was confirmed for the Supreme Court in 1991 when he was 43 years old. If he remains until he's 90, the age at which Justice Stevens resigned, he'll be on the Supreme Court for 47 years. So this doesn't sound ideological. Elena Kagan and John Roberts were each 50 when they were confirmed for the court. If they remain until they're 90, they'll each be there 40 years. That's just too much power to be exercised by a single person for too long a period of time. Also, too much turns on the accident of history. Richard Nixon had four vacancies to fill in his first two years as president. Jimmy Carter had no vacancies to fill in his four years as president. 18-year non-renewable terms would mean that every president gets two vacancies to fill, and I think that that would be very desirable. Term limits for justices. Uh, do you think that it requires a constitutional amendment? I do. So I, th I think we probably agree about that. Certainly we require a constitutional amendment. I think it's extremely unlikely to happen, but I don't object to it in principle. I, I, uh, merit selection. Also, well, merit selection sounds nice, and it is a way that state, many state judges are chosen with merits, with quote, merit selection. Uh, it often doesn't work out quite as nicely as it sounds. So merit selection in a lot of states ends up really being selection by you know, AB, the ABA and or trial lawyers and so forth. And so I'm not sure that you quite actually end up with uh, judges of greater merit when you adopt merit selection. I think, I'm, I think that would also require a constitutional amendment, which I think is extremely unlikely, but I don't think I'd be in favor of it in any case. It doesn't require a constitutional amendment. Mm. Let me explain it, okay. and let me talk about how it's worked in states. Okay. The proposal would be that a president would voluntarily create a merit selection panel. Jimmy Carter did this for federal district court and federal court of appeals judges. He never got a Supreme Court vacancy. And I think I could argue that Jimmy Carter's nominees were by any measure among the very best in history, certainly the most diverse in that point in history. And the way I would have the Merit Selection Panel work for the Supreme Court is I would have a president appoint, and you can make up the number, 15, slightly more from his or her political party and less from the opposition, and say, I want you to send me two or three names of the people you believe would be the best justices, and I want to make sure that they're supported by two-thirds of you so it would be a bipartisan support. And the president would say, I will either pick from your list or ask you to send me additional names. <clears throat> Nothing in, would require a constitutional amendment for a president to create that on his or own. Jimmy Carter did that. Um, how has it worked in the states? I looked a lot and talk about in the book Alaska, which is a system created by a state constitution like this. And it's worked incredibly well there. To give you one example, Sarah Palin, a Republican governor ended up picking for the Alaska Supreme Court Morgan Christen, who Barack Obama then put on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Sarah Palin was limited to either choosing from those names given to her or asking for other names. Morgan Christen was the name that she picked. And again, to show that it isn't about ideology, the same person Sarah Palin picked, Barack Obama then picked for the Federal Court of Appeals. I don't see any impediment to a president doing this. Now, I think the result would probably be we wouldn't get the far left or far right nominees. 
It would have to be somebody who would please a supermajority of the selection panel. But I think that would be a good thing. Now, I believe most of the justices, they're not all on the current court, would have made it through a merit selection program. But I think there are so many justices in history, and the three of us could agree, who were chosen because they were cronies or for political reasons, who would have never made it through a merit selection system. Um, you know, just on, 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 <clears throat> on merit uh, selection, um, uh, uh, Dahlia Lithwick has an interesting uh, piece in the New Republic recently saying, this court is too meritocratic. All Harvard and Yale, I think John Roberts was asked recently, are you disturbed by the fact that all the justices have gone to elite law schools? And he said, uh, not at all. Uh, some of them did not go to elite law schools. They went to Yale. <laughs> so would we be better off with cronies, in other words? I think that just means that there's been too narrow a definition of what's merit. And I agree with Dahlia Lithwick's criticism that of the current court, every borough from Manhattan has a justice who grew up there, except for Staten Island, but only two of the justices on the current court grew up west of the Mississippi, and only one was appointed from west of the Mississippi. Um, unlike, say, the court that decided Brown versus Board of Education, there's no one on the current court who was a governor or a senator. And so I think there has to be a much broader definition of merit. Though again, to be fair, my primary criticism of the current court isn't the lack of merit, though I think in the long term, Merit selection would be something that would improve the Supreme Court in the lower federal courts. Great. Well, we have some uh, oh, more beat on merit. Well, I, I guess I would just say, notice the um, policy preference baked into the analysis. So we would all agree that Jimmy Carter's judicial nominees were among the best. I'm not sure we would all agree to that. In fact, I am sure that I would disagree about that. And as a, and, um, uh, Sarah Palin chose a judge who was then chosen by President Obama to be on the Ninth Circuit. That does not, to me, vindicate the merit selection process. But it shouldn't for you either, unless you just are taking a sort of nakedly political view of the thing. This is, you know, these things have a these things have a valence. We have some wonderful questions from our wonderful uh, audience, as always. And the first one relates to a question that you address in the book, Erwin. The question is, to what extent should justices be required to recuse themselves in the event of a conflict of interest? Uh, you talk about the ethics and recusals of Supreme Court justices. How do you think they could be reformed? And I would hope this also would be one we might agree about. Right now, it is left to each justice to decide for himself or herself whether to be recused in a case. I believe that no person should be a judge of himself or herself. I think we need to create a mechanism where there is a request for a justice to disqualify himself or herself, it goes to, it can be a panel of the justices, it can be a panel of lower federal court judges, it just should no longer be left to that justice to decide for himself or herself. I don't object to that in principle. Um, here's another great question for you, Erwin, with the entire book is designed to answer it. Do you think the court has too much power? How can it be curbed? And this goes to something we were talking about. I believe in the Supreme Court. I believe it's necessary to enforce the Constitution. I think that the ways in which I would want to check the court are the list of things that Jeff mentioned. Clear definition of the role of the court, merit selection, a more meaningful confirmation process, term limits for justices, changing the way the court communicates, apply the ethical rules that now govern federal district court and federal court appeals judges to the Supreme Court change the recusal process. I think all of those together could be a meaningful change in the Supreme Court. I guess I would just say to me that is odd. If you believe the things in this book, I think you have to believe that the Supreme Court has wildly too much power. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand actually how these things are consistent. This book is an indictment of the Supreme Court throughout history and a claim that the, that the Supreme Court is, in effect, doing nothing but policy. If those things were true, then I would think the court had wildly too much power. Now, I don't happen to think those things are true, but if you did, I think you would have to. <laughs> <laughs> one, one beat on that, Erwin, though, sure. because pre President Obama made a similar uh, criticism of his fellow liberals. In his book, The Audacity of Hope, 
uh, in his chapter on judicial minimalism, he said liberals made a big mistake in the 1960s, relying so heavily on the courts. That was a brief shining moment when the court happened to be liberal. It's not going to happen again. And said President Obama, over time, most of the great advances for civil rights and civil liberties have come from the political process, from community activism, not from the courts. It's just nostalgic thinking to be putting your faith in judges where you're going to lose anyway. I disagree in maybe this way of answering the point that just Nick just made. And let me give some examples. Let me start with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Does anyone in this room realistically believe that southern state legislatures were going to repeal the laws requiring segregation? How long would it have taken for southern state legislatures to do that? And do you believe that Congress was about to pass a law that eliminated segregation in the South? A Congress that was so dominated the seniority system by Southern representatives and senators that it wasn't until 1964 that the first major civil rights law after Reconstruction got adopted. So when it comes to the end of Jim Crow laws, it was the court or nothing. Or let's take Baker versus Carr and Reynolds versus Sims, where together the Supreme Court held that the malapportionment of state legislatures denied equal protection. Do you believe that state legislatures, where the legislators benefit from malapportionment, were about to vote themselves out of office by redrawing districts? Earl Warren said he thought that the most important cases during his tenure as Chief Justice were Baker versus Carr and Reynolds versus Sims because they did make the political process work. Or Gideon versus Wainwright. The Sixth Amendment to the Constitution was written in 1791. From 1791 until 1963, in many states, there was no right to an attorney, even when a person was facing a prison sentence, even life in prison. If the states didn't do it from 1791 to 1963, why do you believe that the states were about to do it suddenly after that? Or take some of the rights that the Warren Court expanded for criminal defendants. 1961, Knapp versus Ohio, saying if police and state and local governments violate the Fourth Amendment, the evidence will be excluded. Do you think a state legislature was about to pass a law that said that if the police violate the Fourth Amendment, the evidence will be excluded? So I think all of these are examples of we didn't put too much faith in the court. In fact, these are cases that show me why we need the court, but I think that the court can do a lot better than it's done. Well, I missed, so, so that was the case for the Supreme Court, but this right. book is the case against the Supreme Court. So, but which is it? What, no. What's the, I, I understood this book to say some very nice things about cases like Brown v. Board of Education, but to say that on net, you thought the Supreme Court had made the world a worse place. Is that wrong? I think you've mischaracterized what I say. I say repeatedly in the book, I am not claiming that every Supreme Court case was wrong. That would be nonsensical. But what about on I net? Also, I don't know how to do the on net, which I chose the words very carefully in the book. I don't know how to add up all of the good decisions and all of the bad decisions and say, on that. here's what I can claim, is that I believe that the Supreme Court through American history has often failed at the most important times and in the most important ways. And I'd even go so far as to say that the court in so many of these decisions has made society worse. I'm very comfortable making that claim. But I also, in the book, I praise United States versus Nixon um, and say that I think that the Supreme Court there upheld the rule of law and that no person is above the law and begin a chapter with that. I praise the court's recent decision in United States versus Windsor that struck down a provision of the Defense of Marriage Act. I begin a chapter with that example. So I don't portray the court as always wrong. But I do want to suggest in so many cases the court has made our society worse. Erwin is right that he chooses his words carefully. He says um, he will talk about cases where the court succeeded. But my claim is the court has often failed when it has most been needed. Throughout American history, the court has usually been on the side of the powerful, and it has largely uh, failed to enforce the Constitution. So it is, uh, the, the, do you oh, still uh, think there's a, there's a tension in, in his argument? Well, uh, of course he's not. Of course, the claim is not that they get every single case wrong. But I had understood the book to say that on net the court was making the world a worse place, 
And I guess I was primarily basing it on the title, case against the <laughs> Supreme Court. There are there's some nice things that we can say in favor of the Supreme Court, but I took the book to be in large part an indictment. But I think, just to be clear about the thesis, to say that the Supreme Court has often failed through American history at the most important times in the most important ways is in itself a case against the Supreme Court. Just a few more questions. Here's a good one for your thesis that values matter a lot. The question is, how does the religious background of the present members of the Supreme Court influence their value decisions? There's no doubt that justices' values influence how they decide cases. One of the things we haven't said here is, why do Antonin Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg so often disagree? They're equally smart. They're equally knowledgeable is that they start with different value premises. And I believe that the race of the justices influences how they perceive things. I believe that the religious background, the economic background influences things. Now the difficulty is sometimes in knowing what variable leads to what result. And there's a tendency to be too reductionist. So I'm going to give a specific example. On June 30th of this year, the Supreme Court in a 5 to 4 decision in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby held that it violates the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to require that family-held businesses provide contraceptives that violate the religious views of the owners of the business. The five justices in the majority were all Catholic men, just Alito wrote, joined by Robert Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas. The four dissenters were the three women justices on the court, and of the four dissenters, three were Jewish and one was Catholic. And so some, such as Dahlia Lithwick, have written about this in terms of the religious background of the justices and the gender of the justices. And it's there. What everything I said to you is factual. No one could disagree with those being the facts. But is it the religion and the sex of the justices that explains why Burwell versus Hobby Lobby was 5-4? Or is it that the five most conservative justices were in the majority and the four more liberal justices were in dissent? My guess is it's probably all of that. It is about ideology, it is about religion, it is about sex. I don't want to reduce it to any one variable. We can't reduce it to any one variable. Pretty strong stuff. It's mostly ideology, maybe religion and sex plays a part, but law really does not uh, respond. And I think law plays the predominant part, and these other things may play some role, but um, it is actually the job of the justice to minimize the role of these other factors. So. No, if you, um, I, I guess there are two different questions we could tease out here. As a descriptive matter, do you think religion of the religion or race or whatever of the justices driving, influencing their decisions descriptively? But then, sort of normatively, do you think that it should? Do you think that it should? And I think that most of the justices would say it shouldn't, and we are up here trying to see that it doesn't. Now, we may be failing. It may be impossible for us to completely abstract away our background or our race or our religion or so forth, but that that's the project and that's the job and that's what we're at least trying to do. I think they uh, largely succeed in that. Not completely, but largely. So it's coincidence in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby that it's split five to four along ideology, or it's coincidence with regard to the Defense of Marriage Act that it's five to four split along ideology. And I think the reason that it, you're drawing a false distinction, let me take Burwell versus Hobby Lobby as an example. Now, that's a case about a statute, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It's not about the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But the court had to face questions. Can a secular for-profit company claim to have a religious conscience and religious free exercise? Is it a substantial burdening of that religious conscience to require that it provide an insurance option to women that includes contraceptives? Is there a compelling government interest in making sure that contraceptives are available for women? Is there a less restrictive alternative? You can't answer any of those questions based on the text of the statute or anything that was said in the legislative history of the statute. Inevitably, those are choices that have to be made. And the choices are influenced by the views of the justices, which is why they come out five to four. It's not that some are doing better law than the others. It's that they're making different value choices. This is worth responding. So mm -hmm. is it a coincidence? Justice Ginsburg, after all, accused her colleagues, her male colleagues, of having a blind spot 
after Hobby Lobby. On the other hand, Nick, as you say, there's no question that the justices themselves believe that they are driven by their views of the Constitution and not ideology. Justice Breyer has said that to me and others in public uh, arguments, and the justices are shocked and resist the suggestion that they're driven by politics. Are they, as Irwin suggests, deluding themselves? Well, I, I think that they are, I think they are striving to abstract away from their personal backgrounds with greater or lesser success, but this is a thing that we are capable of doing, and you can find opinions in which the justices actually vote contra what we take to be their policy preferences because they've successfully answered a legal question that they think is actually different from the policy question. You know, if you took this extreme realist view, then how would you think about the choosing of justices? Suddenly you wouldn't think to yourself, is that person very learned in the law? Is this a person who excelled at a great law school and then had a great life in the law and has dedicated themselves to the study of the thing? You would think to yourself, I want a justice who looks like me. I want one who is my race and my gender and my political preferences so that they'll go, go up there and represent me at the court. And uh, the minute, it, it, in very much the same way that you might think about a representative, about your congressman. I want one like me who will go represent what I am like when they get to Congress. But I think the minute that you started thinking about justices that way, you would quickly ask yourself, well, why is there this institution to begin with? If, the, if they're going to be exactly the same as congressmen, why aren't we leaving it up to congressmen? But they're not exactly the same as congressmen. Congressmen face re-election. And anybody who faces election, that is an enormously powerful influence and decision. What, Nick, I don't think you've addressed what I've said several times is what makes the court different is they don't face election. And that we as a society are better off having the rights of criminal defendants or the rights of prisoners or the First Amendment rights of unpopular groups decided by those who are not elected. So yes, members of Congress and members of the court are both doing balancing, but we want certain choices, those that are enforcing the Constitution to be made by those who don't face electoral accountability. Uh, I'm going to ask one last uh, question. Nick uh, pointed to cases where Supreme Court justices reach constitutional conclusions that differ from their political conclusions. Justice Scalia often notes his votes in the flag burning cases. He says he doesn't like hippies who burn flags, but he votes to protect their rights. Um, Irwin, can you point to some cases where your constitutional conclusions diverge from your political views? Sure, I mean in the sense that I can point to cases where I say that the Constitution, at least based on precedent, leads to a certain result but I would come to a different result, or at least until precedent would be overruled, I think one has to come to that result. Um, and so I could identify instances where I think that if you're going to follow precedent, you'd say, yeah, this is the right answer. Um, is an example of this, I would say, the Supreme Court decisions with regard to punitive damages. I think that those decisions, so long as they are in force, say that there are constitutional limits on punitive damages. I don't like the idea. But I think that if I were a justice until those decisions were overruled, I'd have a problem. Well, I'll answer your question in a different way. Imagine a miracle happened, and I became a federal district court or a federal court of appeals. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a fine miracle. <laughs> I would follow Supreme Court decisions even when they, I disagreed with them, because I believed that I was obligated to do so. Now, if I was a Supreme Court justice, I might vote to overrule those decisions. But until I did so, I would follow those decisions. And why would you think Supreme Court decisions were sufficiently determinate as to bind you, but you do not think the Constitution itself is sufficiently determinate as to bind you if you're a Supreme Court justice? That's an easy one, because the Constitution is written using phrases like, no state shall deny equal protection of the law. No state shall have any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That there shall be no cruel and unusual punishment. That language doesn't bind. That language gives great discretion. Whereas there are Supreme Court decisions that do bind, and they're clear. I'll take as an example. The first case I argued in the Supreme Court was on behalf of a man who was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 50 years for stealing $153 worth of videotapes from Kmart stores in San Bernardino, California. He received a sentence under California's Three Strikes Law, even though he never committed a violent offense. Prior to California's Three Strikes Law, 
No one in the history of the United States had ever received a life sentence for shoplifting. My argument was that it was cruel and unusual punishment. I don't think that the Constitution can tell us whether it's cruel and unusual punishment. The phrase is too ambiguous. I lost five to four. The Supreme Court said that such a sentence does not violate the Constitution. If I was a lower federal court judge, I would have to follow that, even though I vehemently disagree with it. Now, if I ever became a Supreme Court justice, an even more unthinkable miracle, I would overrule that decision. And it, and maybe just to ask yourself, so there were some gasps in the audience at this story, but what are you gasping about? Are you upset that the Supreme Court didn't strike this down? Or are you actually angry at the California legislature that passed this law? That's my answer is both. Well, this, the, the gasps and the interaction, I think, means that it's time for our vote. At the end of a discussion, I have to say, has been more collegial than any I can remember on the stage. <laughs> it's been great to have two uh, uh, colleagues and friends um, debating what I think is really the hardest question in constitutional law. And I, I, this has been a good discussion for me because I've learned uh, much. And I find myself less uh, able to answer with certainty that, that question that uh, students and colleagues and, and people ask all the time, which is, is it all Politics. If nothing else, Irwin has challenged us, those of us who do believe that it's more than politics, to defend our uh, views as rigorously as possible. So here's the vote. Basically, just are you convinced by Irwin's thesis? The thesis of the book is the two preeminent purposes of the court are to protect the rights of minorities uh, and to uphold the Constitution in the face of repressive political majorities. And the thesis is that the court has largely failed at both of these tasks. Who in the audience is persuaded by Irwin's thesis? And, and who disagrees? Irwin, the, the vote is, I would say, more than two thirds in favor of Irwin Chemerinsky. Congratulations, <laughs> Irwin, and thank you for a great discussion. <laughs> You were wonderful. So were you. you. Yeah. I hope we can do this again. Yeah, I'd love to. It yeah. was wonderful. That was exceedingly stimulating. It was wonderful. <laughs> Good job. This is great.